when we last left off a long ass time ago, the team had just experienced Runner Christmas, which is like Christmas but with a lot more pipe bombs. Our story picks up in the past, the 8th of January, Oregon, 2057. The laser sight danced on the skull of liberal politician Carl McHauser, recently outed on the state media as Renel Catessary, a spy rebel. Special agent Peter Colby was prepared to do the job clean. He hung upside down from a vent above a target, who was sitting at a computer terminal, sending out messages of revolution and class uprising onto the Matrix. Colby had breezed his way through Hauser security, a trank dot here, a slap patch there, an auto hooker mashed onto a camera. The bunker was an old, outdated model, intended to survive an invasion by the Russians back in 20 sen. It was actually the Japanese who had ended up invading the west coast, but Colby had been smart enough to get out of San Fran when that shit hit the fan. And here was this man, this slimy middle-aged socialist, this agitator against the monolith that was the prince's. A caller for democracy in a monarchy. An adherent of racial equality when elves were scientifically proven to be superior. A dedicated follower of endangering freedom. A dead man. You're a spy, said Colonel Jordan Formick through his earpiece. You can do anything. And you can especially put a bullet in the head of a known terrorist. Formick had the James Bond act down. He'd spent his life fucking off to various parts of the world, doing classified work to protect the Tiz interests. Colby was more like James Bond Jr. But he's not a terrorist, said Colby, not really. He's just a scared lib hiding in a hole. And liberalism is dangerous, retorted Formic. Especially when we've already got dragons and Indians barking down our doorstep. Not to mention the Japs. Take the shot, but why? Soldier, it isn't your place to ask why, and if you keep thinking it's your place you're getting caught martial. This is a matter of state security. Colby disengaged, pulled back up into the vent, and made slowly for the bunker's locker room. As he neared the surface, the sounds of rain above went from sporadic whispers to a steady hiss. State security? You mean I'm buying the princes another damn month before we inevitably become a democracy? That's dangerous speech, Colby. You sure you want to go down this path? Colby dropped down into the locker room, using his sonar scanner to crack one of the bodyguard's lockers. It's a path we're all going down, sooner or later. The princes can't delay a revolution forever. All this killing re putting kiddie band-aids on a gunshot, this is the absolute wrong way for the ghosts to be going about this. We're a subterfuge agency we should be seeding the population, changing attitudes at a grassroots level. Instead, we wait for an agitator to become a martyr, and then we obligingly martyr the bastard. Formic's unflappable tone turned into one of bitter sarcasm over the radio, dropping the emotionless super spy facade. Might I remind you, special agent, that we're spies? It's not our job to enjoy our work, it's our job to do what the government wants, what the government needs. We're not people, not anymore, we're tools. We're the silenced sniper rifle of the state, the hand behind its back, gripping a knife, and guns and knives do not question. Guns and knives shoot and stab and wound and maim and kill, and they leave the rumination about morality to civilian. Finish the damn job. No, said Colby. No more. He cracked the locker and found what he was looking for, a leather jacket, jeans, a trucker hat, street clothes. If he could stall Formic for a little longer, he could get out without being picked up by his handlers. This is going to be treason, said Formic, darkly. It's not treason, scoffed Colby, it's resignation. I failed the mission, and I resign. That's all this has to be. The question is whether you respect me enough to let me have my resignation in peace. There was a long pause as Colby surfaced out of the bunker, hopping over the comatose bodies in the house above before slipping into the streets of the town. Alright, Colby. I've called off your handlers. Your resignation papers are due tomorrow morning, but I'm sending in cleanup. Consider it on your head. Colby huffed, bowing his head to let the bill of his trucker cap keep the pouring rain off his face. He didn't even glance to the side as a black sub roared by him, stopping in front of the house, and men in body armor with submachine guns poured out. The dull slaps of silenced gunfire merged and danced with the pitter patter of rain. The sign taunted Colby as he growled and continued to walk away. Now leaving Bend, Oregon, the 14th of January, Snohomish, Seattle Metroplex, 2074. Peter Colby or, rather, Sean Falstaff, sat in the hydroponics room of his hippie commune in Snohomish, on the phone with his youthful girlfriend, Emily. A marijuana joint slowly burnt down towards his fingers. He hadn't really taken to the drug, but it was part of fitting into the community. 
and hey, it helped with the PTSD. Emily, I swear, I'm getting out of the business as soon as I hit the big leagues. We're already prime runners, we just haven't had our data's deal yet. We haven't hit the big score that turns it from a job into a hobby. I don't want to lose you, Sean. You were in serious danger during that whole universal on that edge thing. If you think your life is threatened, I want you to break off. It's not that simple, Emmy, sighed Ben, pulling the joint to his lips, thinking about it, and then grinding it down on the tile counter. I have loyalty to those guys. It's like a brotherly thing, and I'm your lover. You're going to have to choose eventually. Not if I have anything to say about it. Look, I just finished a really simple milk run. I'm going to ask Brianna to give us something big for the next run, then I'm out, okay? But I'm doing that run, start to finish. I want some retirement funds. There was a long pause. Okay. I love you. I love you too. See you this weekend. Ben hung up, pocketed his comb and his ragged thrift shop jeans, and climbed the ladder up to the surface of the compound. The first thing he saw was a blinding spotlight, then the outlines of gun barrels. The other hippies in his commune were face down and cuffed, shouting at the pigs. Night errant. Night errant had raided the compound, working on reflex. Ben took the shape of a seagull and shot into the night sky, zipping past the night errant security teams and alighting on a rooftop outside the compound. A man with a loudspeaker at the entrance to the compound announced. Sean Falstaff, you are wanted for possession of an illegal substance, and licensed mercenary work, larceny, grand theft auto, and child murder. Show yourself immediately and we will not use force. Taking the form of an elf once more, Ben grimaced. Child murder? Not wanting to find out what Knight Errant did to kid killers, he dropped his clothes, donned his tax suit, and somersaulted into the alleyway behind the building before melting into traffic. He called Wildcard and got no response. Then Dervish, no response again. He thought for a moment, sucked it up, and called Locke. This number is not in service right now, please try again later. Although it was not an unusual feeling for an infiltrator, Bend realized that he was completely, totally alone. Fuck. The 9th of January, downtown Seattle, 2074. Mrs. Johnson was a nervous housewife, sitting in a trendy Spanish fusion restaurant that she did not look to be appreciating. Or, more specifically, Mrs. Wellers was a nervous housewife, sitting in a trendy Spanish fusion restaurant that she did not look to be appreciating. Look, Mrs. Johnson, said Locke, peevish that he'd had to waste his suit on an obviously amateur Johnson. Your name for the purposes of the verbal contract is Johnson. By identifying yourself as well as you're compromising the security of both halves of the operation. Mrs. Johnson trembled. She was dressed in a conservative dress with an old antique analog watch on her wrist. Evidently she didn't get out much. I mean sorry. I needed you to know that I was Mrs. Wellers so that you knew that I was having you rescue my children. Not that I was some stranger kidnapping children for some god awful purpose. So the job is the retrieval of children from their guardians. Mrs. Johnson? We don't differentiate between good or bad. Your moralizing is irrelevant. We just need details and a sum. Tears welled in Johnson's eyes. My me late husband and I worked for us during the interdepartmental conflict last year. During the conflict, Shadow Renersthi kidnapped my children, Madeline and Timothy. And they didn't give them back during the reunification. Locke sighed with exasperation. So you want us to rescue them? Johnson nodded frantically up and down, sobbing into a handkerchief. Mrs. Johnson, do you have any lids? If your children are just somewhere then I'm afraid we can't help you. Johnson continued to nod and slipped a piece of e-paper forward. It detailed an apartment complex in Inra's neighborhood. I did, did a lot of searching on social networking sites. Two of the runners retired, and kept the kids theory Madeline and Timothy Robbins now. Legitimate rage showed in Mrs. Johnson's eyes through the tears. They renamed my children. They named my children after them. Mrs. Johnson, said Locke. Tentative, are you absolutely sure that they're your children? That this isn't a false positive? There are too many coincidences, sobbed Mrs. Johnson, shaking her head back and forth. Night errant won't help me. They treat me like I'm hysterical. The team settled back into their seats awkwardly. Wildcard stared at his burrito, making flawless eye contact with two jalapeno slices. Bend repeatedly poked his salad with his fork. Stirring it around but not actually eating any of it, Dervish whispered to Wildcard if he was going to eat the rest of his burrito. Locke finally broke the silence. How much are you asking, Mrs. Johnson? Just anything. Anything. I want my children back. 
Well usually don't go below 30,000 million. Mrs. Johnson's expression turned steely. Done. Wildcard winced a little bit. The etiquette was to bargain down from the high price and find a happy middle. They'd just stiff Mrs. Johnson hard. Alright Locke shook Mrs. Johnson's quivering hand. We'll get little Timmy and Maddie back. Where's our drop off? I'm staying at the Radisson up the street from the Civic Center, Mrs. Johnson said. Room 206. You can't come in through the window? Yeah, said Locke Demure. We can do that. Mrs. Johnson sobbed her thanks, and then ran off. As soon as she was out of earshot, Wildcard noted. I feel like a horse's ass for cheating her like that. Shadow meets it is good to see you return. Devish shrugged. It's what she gets for not reading up. Besides, we're doing the right thing during this run, right? We get to play white hat, so it doesn't matter if we cheated her or not. Right, Bend? Ben sighed loudly and pushed his salad over to Dervish, who promptly began to shovel it into his mouth. The 9th of January, Ra's neighborhood, downtown Seattle, 2074. The building, Ra's arms apartments everyone groaned at the pun was likely defended. More a home for low-level employees or families coasting on cushy staff positions than contracted mercs. There were the obligatory night air and ultra cops patrolling the neighborhood, but they were comparatively sparse. That didn't mean, of course, that they wouldn't come pouring out of the woodwork if the team fucked up, so Wildcard did the same thing that 2D had once done and hacked the traffic registry. The better to facilitate their escape in the event of a high speed vehicle chase. The mission legwork went quickly. Locke bluffed his way in, pretending to be a visitor, and although he wasn't allowed past the front desk no visiting after hours, sir, I apologize. He did manage to get a list of apartments by name, from there. It was trivial to find the Robbins family a family of four, living on the third floor. With a window overlooking the parking lot behind the building, Dervish, in his cloaked armor recently oiled and fitted with quieter servo motors, sat at the bottom of the building as he and Bend worked to set up a rappelling system at the third story window. Wildcard hacked the building's security system like dodging an angry dog chained to a backyard fence post he chuckled to turn off the window's alarms, and then let Bend work his magic. Backdoring on Dervish's wideband radar and juxtaposing it with his own sonar and thermo input, Bend was able to identify that they were entering the children's bedroom, that the two kids were sound asleep, and that the parents were watching Grid in the living room. A final check on the building's registries confirmed everything the mother and father were both ex merc and the kids were adopted, not blood related. The children's family was said to be deceased in interdepartmental conflict. Alright, said Wildcard over the cervicals. Holding a fist with a thumb up outside of his car window, everything checks out, do it. Bend nodded not that anyone could see and began silently carving a small hole out of the window, just enough for him to reach in and undo the manual latch while Wildcard worked the electronic one. With a pop, the window opened, and the children stirred. Not wasting any time, Ben stuck a slap patch filled with sedative onto each of the children's arms. And 12-year-old Madeline and 9-year-old Timothy went limp underneath their glow-in-the-dark star-covered ceiling. Rainwater dripped off his tax suit, falling onto the cartoon character adorned carpet. Dervish. Get ready. Dervish had been climbing to a halfway point on the second story, and Locke stood below him on a planter in front of the parking lot. Ben passed the girl down first, and then the boy. Locke was the first to notice something wrong, as he held Timothy in his arms. Something's wrong. The kid's having problems breathing. Wildcard bolted out of the car. Trailing the deluxe medkit he kept in his glove compartment. Fuck, it's an adverse reaction to the narco. Someone hold out the kid's arm while I get the succinylchiline. Bend hissed into the cervicals, as he placed the little cutout sliver of glass into place in the window once more. What's going on down there? Kid's gonna suffocate. Dervish, hold him steady. Lock, clear his airway, we're going to stick an oxygen tube down there. Lock gulped, fuck, I didn't know you were this prepared for this, wildcard. Rain trickled over the lenses of Wildcard's mask and he wiped the condensation off with his sleeve before giving the limp boy the injection. He placed a respirator over the boy's face before starting the attached inhaler. Call it experience. Luckily the dose of narco we gave him isn't going to stay in his system for long, but this is one hell of an allergic reaction while it lasts. We'll need someone to watch him on the way back. Locke nodded. I can do that. I've got the second most medical training in the team, still on the third floor and packing up his rappelling technology. Ben saw the flashing lights and sirens coming from a few blocks away. We've got company. Move. 
Locke and Dervish placed the kids between them on the middle seat of the Hyundai while Wildcard revved the engine. Bend practically frog jumped down the side of the building before sliding over the hood and jumping into the shotgun seat. Seat belts, everyone. On the freeway, Wildcard looked over his shoulder and pointed at Locke. How's Timmy doing? He's breathing. Completely blacked out though not moving. We may want to hide out for a few hours before we give the kids back to mum. Let the drug run its course. We also don't know if the kids are chipped, retorted Dervish. Who cares if he's out cold? Wait yelled Locke, excited. Wait. He just mumbled and started grabbing at my hand. He's sleeping normally. He's good. Wildcard sighed. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Let's not pull that trick again. Don't want to have any deoxygenated brain damage tots on my hands. Mrs. Wellers awoke to the tapping of fingers on her window. Seeing her two children sitting on the recliners on the hotel balcony, she burst into tears and ran to the window in nothing but a t-shirt and her underwear. Ben deactivated his cloak and coughed. Mission completed. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Sobbed Wellers. She reached out as though to embrace Ben, and then, seeming to think better of it, walked back inside. I'm still waiting on the bank to accept my withdrawal, but you'll have your money tomorrow. Thank you so much. Anything to help, said Ben with a smile, before disappearing off the edge of the balcony. The 14th of January, Renton, Seattle, 2074. Wildcard was sitting at his kitchen table, eating breakfast as you do, when the SWAT team breached. He had considered running when he caught the node signature three blocks away, but then he had found the tacknet of the three snipers watching each of his house's doorways. Better to see what they wanted. He was mobbed up, and this was hostile territory to the cops, Finnegan Turf. If he needed to escape, he could escape later. If he needed to be bailed out, he'd get bailed out. As the laser sights fluttered over his Cheerios, Wildcard calmly asked, I don't suppose that you gentlemen brought me orange juice? Because I'm out. The response was a SWAT operative grabbing him by the back of the head, throwing him out of the chair, and cuffing him. Calvin McIntyre, you are under arrest for possession of illegal firearms, criminal hacking, and licensed mercenary activity, multiple traffic violations of varying degrees of severity, and child murder. Gentlemen, we all know the game. I'm not going to get busted on any of those charges except for the fourth one, and the fifth is just insulting. You have the right to remain silent. Wildcard sighed, standing up and arching his back to stretch as the cop behind him struggled to grasp his arms again. I can also haver on if I feel like it, copper. I'm not going to struggle because that would mean you'd actually have an opportunity to do some real damage. Wildcard deserved the cuff to the back of the head he got for that, but it had been worth it. As he was escorted out of his front door, he nodded to a crowd of suited mafiosos watching the whole proceeding. Take care of the car. Keys are in the knife drawer. One of the mafiosos, a generic looking young man who could well have been a salaryman in another life, made a grunt of affirmation and began walking toward the garage. A police officer activated his stun stick and gestured at the crowd as Wildcard was loaded into the back of the black truck. Clear out. This is night errant business. Dawn, the 15th of January, Redmond Barons, Seattle Metroplex, 2074. Attention, residents of this compound, wake up. An entire brigade of night errand cops stood in perimeter around their pair of axe and a SWAT tank, nervously eyeing the scattering refugees behind them. They faced a set of double concrete walls topped with barbed wire, behind which was a ruined old office building topped with camo netting and lumber reinforcements. The captain checked his mic, and spoke through the loudspeaker again as the bomb squad prepped their tools behind him. I repeat wake up and make contact or we will breach. We have called the bomb squad to disarm any and all booby traps, and are prepared to use lethal force. Jose Rodriguez and Garrett Jordan, show yourselves. A heavy attack chopper circled overhead, shining a spotlight through the broken windows of the complex. Dervish yawned, looked out his window, and sighed to himself. Idiots. Making this much noise will just attract the mutants. As if on cue, a troll covered in horrible lesions and radiation burns came screaming out of a nearby junk pile, wielding an entire stoplight as a medieval polyme. Gimme yetrowax. With a yelp, one of the riot cops opened up with his gun, prompting the troll to throw the stoplight, smashing the man back towards the axe like an armored rag doll. The rest of the police quickly organized and put the mutant down in a hail of fire. Scan windows. Check for hostiles. 
Dervish leisurely strolled downstairs, getting dressed and armored, as the cops continued to do battle with the small tribe of mutants that Dervish knew made their home in the wreck down the street. It was about time someone cleared them out, anyway. Nevertheless, he was curious as to what exactly was going on, so he made his way to the intercom and loudly asked, What happens if I don't come out? The police captain, having scrambled to the roof of one of the apps, yelled back. We bomb your compound. Dervish gave this some thought. I suppose I don't have much of a choice then. Am I under arrest? Not yet, Sergeant Jordan. We just want to take you back to the office and ask a few questions. With a blaring noise, the gate of the compound slid open and Dervish marched out, armored up with his shotgun strung up on his back. Well, let's get to it, then. I don't have all day. Dusk, the 15th of January, Redmond Barrens, Seattle, 2074. Felix Ramirez knew that they would come for him eventually. Two of their operatives were moving through the hallway to apartment 206 now. He could see them through the thin drywall as he hid behind his bed. The AS technology operatives had made one major mistake, and that was that Locke had moved from room 206 to room 207 last Wednesday. As the soldiers breached his old room, Felix bailed out of the door into the hallway, taking off at a sprint and putting covering fire on the doorway to 206 with his pistol. He turned the corner and heard orders for backup being shouted in English, curiously. It was at this point that he began to consider that this was not an isolated set of as technology operatives. He amended his hypothesis to night errant SWAT as he turned another corner and found himself face to face with a taser shockwave booby trap. Pewter de Mirage. As Locke spasmed violently and crashed to the floor, the SWAT team circled around him, training their guns on his twitching form. Quick, black bag him. Chief Inspector wants him by midnight. The Chief Inspector of Night Air in Seattle, a broad African-American human in his mid-forties, sat across a boardroom table from three shadow runners in varying degrees of condition. Garrett Jordan was the real catch one of the world's top gunmen and even better with a cyber blade, a hardcore merc with ties in Lagos, Japan, the Yukus military, and Raz itself. The orc sat across from the chief inspector, looking resentful. Next to him, calm and weirdly bland without his distinctive get-up, was the operative only known as Wildcard, rumored to be, among other things, the world's best getaway driver. The chief inspector had taken the liberty of removing Calvin McIntyre from the Rasin database, as it was almost certainly a fake. The third man, groaning and leaning face first into the table, was the newcomer, whom a cursory DNA test had turned up as Felix Ramirez, a rogue Aztec mage with a truly preposterous bounty on his head. Notably absent was the former T ghost, alias of Sean Falstaff, who had predictably eluded capture. The chief inspector hoped that he might be persuaded to come in on duress to his teammates. On any other day, this would be one of the greatest busts of the inspector's career. These four were purported to be big shots in the Seattle underground, not run a legend level, but at the top of the game. However, they were untouchable. Their fixer knew the system well, Wildcard had mob ties, Falstaff was a Titangar citizen, and the chief inspector technically had to answer to a former teammate of theirs, and resented it. Which was why this whole operation was going off record, and he was going to shoot them all in the head himself if they wouldn't play ball. The chief inspector knew that he had a few legs up. Most of them revolved around Ramirez, the party didn't have their face in the best condition to handle negotiations, and in fact Ramirez could be used as leverage with as technology if push came to shove. There was also the fact that, if push came to shove came to a firefight, they had been frisked and were about a man and a half down in the middle of Knight Errant's home office. Gentlemen, began the chief inspector, you can call me Mr. Johnson. And you can call me Trixie, the prostitute in Halloween Town who trades toothless blowjobs for a packet of Novocoke per. But that doesn't make it true. Dervish shot back. His Sibiri covers retracting to give the inspector a better view of his death glare. Runners work for money, not threats. One of those threats is pretty convincing, noted Johnson, pointing to the groaning Ramirez. You don't clean up your own mess. He gets deported back to Aztlan. Wildcard spoke up. His Scottish brogue sounding very alien coming from his generic, wasp Y features. Congratulations, you daft Bobby. You've mildly inconvenienced us. I can't speak for Locke, who may have more invested in this than I, but I got no one to get scalped on behalf of a paddy of hotshot Sherlocks. Johnson growled, this isn't a negotiation, this is a demand. If there's one thing I expect runners to do to keep the status quo, it's to clean up their messes. With a flick of his wrist, Johnson tossed an AR image up above the table. 
It displayed the autopsy tables of Madeline and Timothy Wellers, their faces contorted into expressions of caricature terror, their skin bleached white. Wildcard and Dervish both briefly dropped facade while staring in disgust. What the fuck, began Dervish, those are those kids, Wildcard finished, that we rescued, yeah. Johnson nodded somberly, well, either you're all fabulous con artists, or my hypothesis checks out. You had no idea you were killing the kids when you did your last job. Wildcard stared slack jawed at the bloodless, grey cuts in Timothy's chest, bleached and dry. His considerable medical knowledge was failing him. What in the bloody hell is that? Essence drain. Your last Johnson, gentlemen, was a nightmare. A dark spirit that feeds on fear. And you bought into a sob story and gave it two kids to eat. Two Raz kids. At the mention of nightmares, Locke lifted his head from the table. You can't be expecting us to go pop it. Pop it Johnson gave Ramirez an expression of disgust. I want you to go get its spirit formula, make a metaplanar jaunt, and kill it. Knight Errant already popped it yesterday, but that's not going to stop Mrs. Wellers from coming back in the long run. Your fuck up, your redemption. Dervish stood up, throwing his hands in the air. Welp, I'm out. He was greeted at the door by two armed Knight Errant guards, not that it fazed him. Mr. Johnson. Unless you can turn these two stooges into extra-dimensional creepy crawlies out to steal my soul, I'm taking my chances with shooting my way out of here. Wildcard stayed sitting down, and gestured for Dervish to return. What Mr. Johnson means to say is that, given that we're specialists who are considerably higher tier than the dobbers he's got here in the precinct, he's going to be giving us 40,000 Nguyen up front and access to the Knight Errant Omery. We're going to be needing heavy equipment to geek a damned demon, after all. Johnson glowered, his eyes narrowing in hate. Mr. Johnson, drop the purity act. We're all solids here, and you know it. You're not appealing to us on a moral ground, and you know that. Fact of the matter is, if any of your studios had a chance at taking this thing on, you'd have done it your damn self, and gone on your merry way. You're trying to strong arm us into this because we're the only ones who could pull it off without a big heaping bunch of night errant widows mucking up your public relations. I could have you killed this instant. Wildcard chuckled. And I, you, Dervish is right there Dervish grunted in response. But getting jeeked on either end isn't good for business. And Knight Errant would still have its nightmare problem to deal with. Because we're the only damned lunatics you can even halfway trust to pull this suicide mission off. Veins protruded on Johnson's temple and he bored his hands into fists. But he spat. Armory access. So you have a chance. But you're getting 20,000. I'm not paying you any more than a courtesy price. The team looked amongst each other. Dervish grunted. Actually go to hell. Try to kill a demon permanently. Barely any pay. But on the plus side no child murder prosecution and we get to keep our Mexican. Yeah, that works. Bend, you can show up in a time. A lithe elf in a tax suit appeared on the ceiling behind Johnson. Before dropping to the floor in a cat-like stance. Standing up. And walking over to the rest of the team. As usual, Locke ruins it for everyone. And Felix was totally his real name. I wish I'd made a bet on that. Dervish used his shoulder to brace Locke, helping him stand up. Stop being so harsh on the new guy. He proved his worth. Yeah, he did a great job detecting that nightmare. Which is a major's job, last I checked. Seeing that Johnson was beginning to make an angry whistling noise as he exhaled between his teeth, the team wisely made for the armory. Dervish's nose twitched as he disengaged his helmet. Huck. That's a smell. Yeah, I smell it too. Sniffed Bend, looking between racks of ballistic plates and spare ammo for the culprit. Smells like fish. Can't say I smell it, but I'll take you boys word on it, commented Wildcard, plucking a drum of acts off the wall. Now down to business. Like, seriously, Wildcard, grunted Dervish, with a chuckle, you have to smell this. We're talking the alleyway behind a sushi restaurant. Doesn't Knight Errant have janitors? Okay. Fine, but only cause you piqued my curiosity. Yeah, oh, that is foul. Wildcard clapped his mask back down onto his face. Business? Please? I gotta get some foci from evidence, said Locke, looking nauseous. Be right back. Bend immediately gravitated towards the sidearms, holdouts and spy toys, mostly. You know, it's a damn shame that only cop core get access to these. He said, fingering a Ruger Thunderbolt burst pistol. Ruger could make a lot of runners happy by going public. Wildcard stomped in in a set of Raz Milspec, albeit a lighter model more on par with Locke's birdsuit than Dervish's man tank. 
Locke also returned to the room, now in his full gear albeit covered in evidence tag. Wildcard eyed the fancy chrome sidearm. Ain't the piece and poses root more your bag? Not when we're about to be fighting demons. I'm not. They get bullets. Glad to see you coming around, grunted Dervish, as his own set of mil spec flexed. Diagnostics were turning out positive on the new hydraulics. Still a pacifist. That hasn't changed. How you doing, rookie? Locke groaned, cradling his head as he fished an obsidian spear tip from a plastic evidence bag. The tip briefly lit up as it attuned to his magic, then returned to normal. Shut up, bend. Felix is growing some balls dervish clapped Locke on the back, smashing him a clear 15 feet across the room into a rack of alphas. Oops. The 15th of January, downtown Seattle, 2074. Tanatia the sun god, in the form of a great form guidance spirit, stood in a laboratory in the Ra's fabrication compound beneath Seattle, holding open a portal that screeched and clamored with the voices of the damned. Three men in armor and one in a skin-tight bodysuit stood before it. Dervish had turned himself into a walking fortress of invulnerability, done up in red, white, and blue. Wildcard, in something resembling the Judge Red suit by way of Rob Lee Ford, tapped at his plasteel faceplate and reminded himself to get the plaster cosmetics to reconstruct his signature ASAP. Felix was loaded down with every focus he could muster over his suit of Aztec armor, fully prepared to spend weeks in withdrawal if he made it out alive. Finally, Bent stood behind them with his new guns and a few new gadgets on his belt, looking the most apprehensive of the lot. Locke ran the team through the drill. Alright, everyone's updated their will. Wildcard's server is set to send them to Brianna if we're not out of there in a week. We've all called loved ones, those who have them, anyway. Dervish leaned in Ben's direction and snickered. Did you really have to give Emily that maybe 50 years from now? Maybe yesterday line Dervish made sure to pause dramatically before whispering yesterday with kissy lips. Hey, said Ben, defensively. She asked when I would be back, and it was really romantic. Plus, accurate, what with Medplanar time shenanigans. Let's not have the Medplanar time shenanigans talk again, groaned Wildcard. Now get your antipsychotics ready, everyone. Shadow spirits feed on emotions, so it'll be best if we all had none. Reaching into the plastic slots on the back of his neck, he chipped a tabula rosa for persona fix. Wildcard's eyes dulled and his expression softened as Locke and Bend each donned a rig and did the same. Dervish drew his sniper rifle from a slot on his back placed the barrel near to his head, and fired, triggering a relapse in the condition caused by his frontal lobe damage, his face contorted with a cruel harshness, and then relaxed. With a monotone that passed sinister and drifted right into downright terrifying, he droned, once marine to the breach. The 15th of January, Shadow Seattle, 20? Huh? Remarked Wildcard, his demeanor muted. I didn't expect it to look like this. He took the form of an old school 1920s gangster in a full suit and fedora, save for his face. Which had taken on a number of aspects of his mask and looked like an animate porcelain. I didn't expect us to look like this, noted Locke, who resembled nothing so much as an Aztec temple made anthropoid, all stairways and fortifications. Met planar appearance. Based off of inner self, think the Matrix, commented Ben who appeared to be the unholy elven bastard child of Sam Fisher and James Bond, done up like a commando on Christmas. A single flower in his hair made the whole ensemble a little surreal. Interesting, noted Dervish, deadpan. Back to the job, he looked like Dervish. The team waded through tall grass in what appeared to be a public park, albeit twisted and of largely relative size. A blasted Seattle loomed above them on all sides, exuding nearly palpable gloom, always in the distance no matter what direction one moved in and yet always at the forefront of the mine. As the team formed a square formation, inching through grass blades the size of palm trees that suddenly shrank and wilted with the slightest touch, Locke stared ahead. I've got something. I recognize the spirit from earlier, 50 meters west. Wildcard moved into position to cover him. Slowly. Locke approached a tiny shred of nothingness, hanging in space like a rift. Raz gave us the little shred they had, so I can compare. There was a pause as he analyzed it, his magical senses intentionally blocked from his environment. No one wants to astrally perceive the shadow meta plane. Fuck. Dervish parted a nearby bush, scanning for movement. Define fuck. These are the same size. Well, size by metaplanar standards, which is iffy. Point being, if they're all this size, then we're looking at five more. Seven shards, commented Ben. I guess that's meaningful somehow, but it escapes me. Wildcard, can you get a bead on them? 
I could, but I'm not magic. Wildcard shot back, moving to Locke's position to keep the group in adjacent twos. Everything's subjective in the meta planes. You're the guy we use to track things normally. Try your computer. Computers won't work in the meta planes, said Wildcard. Negative. Bend blinked, as frustrated as he could be while still emotionally neutered. Not your computer. The idea of your computer. Two totally different things. Wildcard, as if despite Bend, pulled out an ancient 1920s rotary phone. Much to his shock, as he recalled the details of his comlink, it formed a weird, half-finished replica of the piece of tech, responding to his search query. Now that's unnerving. Five shards still across the city. At least I will hell Google has anything to say about it. Closest ones in an office building two blocks away. As if on cue. The grass fell away and shrank down to normal size, revealing a path to the office building in question amidst blasted cars and contorted skeletons. Potholes formed entire gorges amidst the wreckage. The sooner we get this done, the better. Side wildcard, watch your step. As the team searched amidst the desks and cubicles of the nameless office building, Locke reached out to touch a nearby skeleton, sitting in a chair, tie still around its neck. It dissolved into dust although, curiously, its shadow remained. Anyone else reminded of 20 Sen Hiroshima? Looks like a nuke came through here, Bend nodded. When magic first started manifesting, nukes around the world started malfunctioning, maybe this is where they ended up. Can the chatter, grunted dervish. Lock. Location. Formulas ahead. But it's moving. Moving? With a cry of shite, Wildcard fell to the floor, clutching a bloody gash in his stomach. His machine gun began discharging, spraying the office with fire. Contact, Dervish dropped into a crouch, scanning the area around Wildcard. Locke, what was that? It's a spirit, yelled Locke, an invisible one, moving fast, too fast for me to track. With a yelp, Locke was catapulted into the air, hitting the ceiling before falling onto a desk and snapping it in half. No good, said Bend, before running around to nearby cubicles and setting down sensors. Keep your pans on, and shoot when you get movement. Wildcard, network these. Not willing to question the logic of Metaplaner computing again, Wildcard punched buttons at random and the sensors armed. Clutching his stomach, he scrambled to make it to the perimeter. Slowly, Dervish extended one cyber blade. Right as Wildcard was about to make it past the sensors, Dervish launched over him and slammed into a tangible force mere inches behind his teammate. He opened up with one cyber blade, and then began freely maneuvering with the others, delivering brutal and unceasing blows to the invisible foe. Finally, a contorted, shadowy man-like figure appeared very briefly, gasping, before disincorporating into another black wisp. Shard 3, groaned lock. Everyone okay? Peachy, coughed wildcard, producing his medkit to bandage up his midsection. Dervish moved both himself and wildcard back into the perimeter for the team to recollect their thoughts. Next shard, said Dervish. Where? Wildcard tapped at his comlink, clearly not understanding what exactly he was doing. A downtown, roof of one of the skyscrapers. Sounds dangerous, responded Dervish, his voice empty of thought or feeling. Let's go. I'm never going to get over that, Wildcard commented quietly to Ben. The 15th of January, downtown Shadow Seattle, 20? The team found a woman in a wispy funerary gown standing atop the roof of the skyscraper. A raging lightning storm blazed above, periodically striking a mismatched amalgamation of a radio tower, a fire escape, and innumerable humanoid corpses. The tower was terrifyingly thin, and swayed from side to side as its top disappeared into the clouds. The tower is tall, the woman commented, and perilous. Many have tried to reach its height, many have fallen. All lost sight of themselves. Bend craned his neck. Up there? Wildcard nodded somberly. Up there. Damn. You'll never make it, the woman said, her voice echoing eerily amongst the metallic debris. It's too much for anyone. Everyone forgets, unless they give up everything. Shadow spirit, Dervish said, raising his shotgun to the woman. Engaging. Locke put his hand on Dervish's barrel. Hold on. I don't think this is as straightforward as it looks. He speaks the truth, continued the spirit. Sacrifices must be made before the way is clear. Though you be wretches and lost, you have the capacity for sacrifice still. Dervish stepped up. Fine. Assuming the sacrifice is some kind of physical harm, I'm the most likely to survive. State your purpose or we kill you. The spirit chuckled darkly. Very well. You, faceless man, why do you stay in the shadows? Why do you hide from the merchants in their high towers? 
consort with scum and filth. I run for the money, responded Wildcard. The money and the thrill. The spirit nodded soberly, and ran a thin, feminine hand over Dervish's chest. The hand was covered in sores. And you, soul of peace and turmoil. You could do so much better, wide well beneath the surface when you could do good above? Good subjective, commented Ben. I run to escape from the one time I thought I was doing good, and to provide a more ethical alternative to other runners. The spirit again nodded. And you, crack temple? Surely your gods will put up with your absence no longer. Tanatia begs you face the sun, and instead you hide in cities that are anathema to him and his, places of black clouds and shadow. I run to hide from his other servants, commented Locke. As far as I am concerned I am the only legitimate practitioner of the faith. The spirit nodded a third time, considering. And you? Devish grunted. I run for me. And so you have the most to give. There was a moment of dawning realization and everyone had half raised their guns before both the spirit and dervish were already gone. Fuck. Wildcard took a few pot shots at where the spirit used to be before Ben grabbed him by the shoulder. Don't get emotional. If we get emotional they'll get all of us. We need to get that shard. And look. Ben pointed upwards at the tower, the top of which was now clearly visible through a hole in the cloud line. I'm the best climber among us, so I'm going up there. Both of you cover me. Wildcard nodded soberly and he and Locke moved into position as Ben began scaling the swaying wreckage. Periodically he had to take small breaks in which to adhere himself to the side of the structure for particularly violent bursts of wind, but he held his own. A few minutes later, and once he was well out of sight, Ben noted. I've got the fourth part of the formula. And I- Wildcard turned to watch the stairway doors. He had heard something in the distance, but wasn't sure where it was coming from. I found this guy. As the tower began rotating and collapsed down into the roof like a scrap metal vortex, all that was left standing in its former spot was bend, and a naked orc wearing nothing but pants. With two experimental saber legs from the knee down, Wildcard trained his gun on the newcomer, but Locke gave him the he's clear signal and they both lowered their guns. Dervish looked between his former teammates, his expression one of fear and confusion. Who are you guys? What's going on, Dervish, said Wildcard, without a beat, what's the last thing you remember? Dervish put his hand to his forehead and groaned in exertion. I fear was a shootout at a stuffer shack, and I met this blonde goo and hell forget, Dios mio, cursed Locke. The spirit wasn't kidding. At least he's alive, that's what's important, give him some of your backups. Within a few minutes, a very confused dervish hefted wild cards nickel plated predator, adorned in an armored jacket and helmet. You goo are we runners? Am I a runner who lost my memory? Is that what's happening? Why does this city look so spooky? Yes, 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 said Ben, and we're in the shadow meta planes. Dervish gave him a blank look, hell, Dervish gulped, Ben looked to Wildcard, where's the fifth? Funny you should mention that, said Wildcard, fiddling with his comlink, it's incoming. The entire team ducked for cover even Dervish, seemingly operating on instinct as a burst of gunfire shattered the stairway door, the ambient shadows and the gun smoke coalescing into rough facsimiles of armed guards. Corpse of Wraiths commented Locke. Hell has stopped being subtle. Open fire. As the team used cover fire from Wildcard and Locke manifesting as a Thompson submachine gun and a ray of searing light, respectively to move to the fire escape, the shadows around them began coalescing into new and increasingly threatening shapes. Somewhere in the distance, a helicopter's rotor sounded, although the sound was distorted, imperfect, and wrong as though belonging to a vehicle-sized creature attempting to merely imitate a helicopter. The formula's downstairs, on one of the spirits, shouted Wildcard. Get into the building on the next story down, we'll fight a running battle down and try to lose them in maintenance hallways. Dervish fired wildly at the shadows, periodically striking true and dropping a screeching demon. What does that even mean? Just follow our lead. As the team smashed through the door, they tumbled out and down another short flight of stairs, having been disgorged from a parking lot somewhere in Everett. Across from them stood the shadowy double of the Bunraku parlor from Twody, Dervish, Geppetto and Trout's early days running, although Dervish, the only one from that time, couldn't recognize it. A ghostly woman in latex get up, her face obscured by tangible shadow, stood at the doorway. Numerous doubles covered their smoky, vague chins and giggled behind her. Hey, boys. Succubi, Bend, Wildcard, and Locke agreed, speaking simultaneously. Suck you, what dervish looked between his teammates, confused. 
Anyway we're getting through this unscathed lock closed on the succubi, his LMG rays. You'll find that the girls and I have very reasonable rates, said the ambulatory latex suit. Just a little bit off the top, only an hour of time, really, and the spirit formula's all yours. Wellers is just another name to us. Locke did some assessing, bullshit, an hour with you would kill any one of us. And our magic would be the first thing to go. Wildcard grimaced, his mutated porcelain lips widening grotesquely, like a cartoon character. What if Dervish and I spent half time each? Locke gave Wildcard a look of shock. You'd both be crazy fucked up at the end of it, we can't risk it. Behind him, the sucker by giggled, as though this was the height of comedy. Better than fighting them, said Dervish his, voice wavering with uncertainty. I think? He's right, said Ben, somberly, they'd at least come out of it likely alive, rather than if we fought all of them. You see how powerful those spirits are, delicious, said the lead succubus. I get those too, then? 30 minutes each, said Wildcard, walking into the building. Starting now, bend, if my biomonitor flatlines, you know what to do. Dervish clenched his teeth and followed Wildcard. Exactly one half an hour later, Wildcard and Dervish stumbled outside and fell into a groaning pile, clutching between them the second to last fragment. The succubi behind them made kissy noises and then slammed the door. Wildcard slumped up against the wall, unable to lift his head. His skin was deathly pale, his breathing shallow. Locke sensed him and found his essence to be in the fractions. Dervish was doing mildly better, and slowly stood on uneasy legs. We got it, guys, coughed Dervish, holding up the fragment triumphantly. We got it. I don't know what it is but we got it. Ben patted Dervish on the shoulder, eyeing Wildcard warily. Good job, big guy. We only have one left to go, Wildcard. Wildcard slowly, and with much exertion, lifted his head. The momentum of it lolling over his shoulders caused him to smash the back of his scalp into the wall, drawing blood. His eyes were drained off color, reduced to soft gray orbs. Ha! Huh. Ben snapped his fingers in front of Wildcard's face. Wildcard, you with me? Yeah Wildcard let his head drop again, and limply flopped his arm around with the vague, blind intent of being helped up. All things considered getting melted by succubi ain't a bad way to lose a soul. It's not your soul, Wildcard. At least not the whole one. Stick with us. We can get you therapy when you get out of this. Ben braced Wildcard over his shoulder and lifted him. You think you can find the last shard? His mouth hung open, trailing a single strand of drool. Ha. Huh. Oh he. Yep. Here. Wildcard mushed his entire hand into his cum link, but the gesture sufficed. The team found themselves standing in a public library, comparatively clean and bright compared to the rest of Shadow Seattle. As they slowly moved into the foyer, four pedestals rose from the tile floor. On each pedestal was a large, blank tome, with a quill pen and ink. Some kind of trap, noted Ben. Or a puzzle, added Locke. Let's try writing in them, but we're already writing in them, said Dervish. With a start, Locke and Ben realized the three of them were already standing at the pedestals, having seemingly teleported. Wildcard lay on the floor of the foyer, twitching spasmodically. This isn't good said Ben, panic rising in his voice. I can't take my eyes off the book, and I can't stop writing. You guys? Locke and Dervish were in a similar strait. Both here attached to the podiums by their right arms, which were writing feverishly in the books at a rate far faster than any human had and right to do. No matter how they pivoted their bodies, their eyes remained locked on the books, although they found that they could focus on each other's books as well. Peter Colby was born in Portland, Oregon, United States of America, in 2018, to Brandon Colby and Caitlin Vance. As a child, he was bullied for his appearance by the time that he was 8, the oldest metahumans were merely teenagers, and the phenomenon was not well understood. He was plagued by crippling self-doubts that his parents did not love him because he was different, a state of mind that led to a lifelong pursuit of excellence in the military field. Well known for its strictly hierarchical structure, Felix Ramirez was born in Cuzalan, Mexico, in 2020, to Alejandro and Mariela Ramirez. His parents, both poor coal miners for the Oro Corporation, saw his elfin features and magical powers as a gift, despite dark and persistent rumors that Oro's regular medical checkups were actually experiments designed to homegrow soldiers. The implications of which would be that the child was not wholly theirs. Despite the crushing poverty of his childhood, Felix was pampered. Jonathan Red Eagle was born in Alamosa, Colorado, Pueblo Corporate Council, 
In 2024, he at first appeared to be an ordinary human boy before his goblinization, so his unique gene structure went unstudied until his adolescence. His childhood was marked by small incidents of violence common to the transitory times during the formation of the PCC. Compared to his peers, he was only a small percentage native, and his mother was expelled from the fledgling nation early in his childhood. Ben used his other hand to clutch feebly at his head, his eyes becoming bloodshot. What the hell it's stealing my thoughts? A giggling imp appeared, sitting atop one of the bookshelves. And soon I'll have your whole life stories, and then you'll be finished. I'll manage what all of the others couldn't. I'll end the intruders. It cheerily flitted about behind each of the runners, carefully avoiding moving into their peripheries to negate any chance of being attacked. Devish as I scanned his book, feverishly. I have Atwo brothers. And they are both human. And I'm 50 years old. It's leeching our creativity. Felix yelled, pulling his sidearm with his left hand and firing wildly in the general direction of the bookshelves, missing the imp by a mile. Every minute we spent writing is more of our soul getting taken away. All three teammates struggled, calling for Wildcard to help them. Wildcard stirred on the ground, but lacked the strength to lift his gun high enough to shoot at the muse. Peter Colby was fast tracked into the ghosts at the age of 25. As part of his contract, his death was faked and his parents were put into protective custody, where they both still live today. He retains no contact with any of his friends or family from before his spy work, leading to intimacy issues that cause him to be drawn to those younger than him, whom he views as more spontaneous and full of life. Felix Ramirez excelled in the homegrown warrior program, attending military school and training exercises throughout his childhood. The other children in his class, disproportionately orcs, took issue with his meter type and magical acumen, culminating in a fight with another boy, Jose Ramos, in the school gym. Ramos was burned to death by a fire spirit, inadvertently summoned by Ramirez, an event leading to Felix's aversion to sacrifice. Jonathan Red Eagle spent many years sequestered in government testing labs, with the PCC's lax cruelty laws exploited by the still unsolidified nation, despite the protests of his friends and family. However, he disappeared during a terrorist strike on the facility, an act later rumored to be linked to as technology. With a sudden burst of gunfire, the front cover and first few pages of Devish's book disappeared, shredded paper flying everywhere. Wildcard inched across the floor on his belly, gun held aloft and shaking. He edged towards Dervish on his elbows, struggling to train his gun on the book without hitting his teammate. It's useless, crooned the imp. He'll keep writing until he's all mine. Regardless of what you do, and then, when you're done languishing down there, I'll make you write your own. Wildcard leaned his gun against Dervish's podium, letting out a sigh of breath as he let go of the weight of it. He clambered up the podium with grasping, claw-like hands, his head lolling back lifelessly. The imp screeched out a harsh laugh. You can't take the book away from him, either. His hand is stuck there until he's done writing. With a low rumbling growl, Wildcard hefted the back end of his gun through the gaping hole in the front of the book, then put both hands on the underside of the cover and lifted it, forming a rudimentary turret for Dervish. Oh, the imp responded, with a dumbfounded blink. One drum of at Samu later, and the team were all closing their books, massaging their strained eyes with their knuckles. A final wisp of black energy flowed from Dervish's perforated tome and coalesced with the others into a single, ancient looking scroll. Thanks, Wildcard, said Ben. With a warm smile, we are you one. M name's Dylan Cadbury from Edinba. Didn't need to make it a fair play thing. We know you're trustworthy. Ben helped to lift Wildcard again. Hang in there. We've got all the formula fragments. We just need to kill. With a scream, Dervish was lifted bodily into the air and absorbed into a mass of cancerous black shadow with two glaring, red eyes. Ben turned to the nightmare and completed his statement. Well as. Without hesitation. Felix manifested a fire spirit and began hurling gouts of burning ash at the nightmare, as Ben dropped behind his podium for cover. Spraying bursts of explosive handgun bullets at the creature. Loud banging noises from inside the cloud of inky blackness meshed with screams, suggesting that Dervish wasn't going down without a fight. Wildcard crawled for cover behind a bookshelf, taking awkward and mostly useless shots with his holdout pistol, only for the whole bookshelf to lift off the floor and go catapulting into lock knocking him prone and taking a large chunk out of his armor. Ben fought like he'd literally never fought before, abandoning his traditional pacifism to unload round after round into the encroaching black cloud, as a tendril of pure shadow wrapped around him, 
he sped the clip, reloaded, and continued to spray concentrated bursts between the thing's eyes, screaming a wordless yell over the gunfire. And then, it was over. As if an invisible threshold had been reached, Wellers violently exploded, the very force of her personality taking leave and rendering the surroundings blurred and indistinct. Dervish toppled to the floor, the life half drained from him, cracking the tile of the diminishing idea thereof. Wildcard slumped into unconsciousness. Bend let out a half of breath, stumbled over to Locke and, in the almost uncanny silence, gasped out. It's over. Get us back home. His hands trembling, Locke summoned his guidance spirit, which slowly opened a portal. The 13th of January, latitude 42.22, longitude minus 138.5, 2074. I meant home as in Seattle you stupid Mexican fuck, yelled Bend, treading water. Lo Cinto, fuck locked clawed at Bend, trying to scramble out of the water which surrounded them on all sides. Summon a new one you dick. Wildcard and Dervish are sinking. I'm trying. Oh for fuck's sake, Bent stripped off his tactical suit and, stretching his shape change power to the best of its abilities, shifted into the form of a giant squid before holding his companions aloft. The giant squid burbled something angry and squeezed Locke, who hastily summoned another guidance spirit. The 13th of January, downtown Seattle, 2074. Sergeant Powers leaned against the water cooler of the night errant armory, putting the pieces of a dismantled predator back together. Hey, did you hear about the kids that the chief inspector is going on about? Apparently a bunch of runners gave a nightmare some kidnapped kids. Sergeant Maxwell put his helmet in his locker, eyeing the photo of his own kids inside, and winced. I swear, it's criminal how everyone just ignores shadow running, corporate crime, toe the party line, etc, etc. They're a menace to fucking society. You never hear about how runners are killing your kids, just romanticized counterculture bullshit. I'd like to see a good cop movie these days, added Powers, finishing the gun, holstering it, and moving to his own locker. Search me as to why the crime genre is so popular with the kids these days. Well, you have to admit, it is pretty glamorous, noted Maxwell. You never see runners make stupid mistakes unless it's for drama, so, abalabalabalabalabal. With that, four tons of seawater, three runners in full mil-spec gear, approximately 25 assorted fish, and a giant squid clutching a tax suit fell into the armory. One more time, one more time, yelled the giant squid, as it popped back into the form of a handsome and very naked owl. Wait hold on I think this is yesterday, responded the runner wearing a beak-esque helmet. Okay, yelled the former squid. Make sure to arrest us tomorrow or else causality will be interrupted. WH Powers slowly picked himself up. What? Thanks bye. The 16th of January, downtown Seattle, 2074. The team gathered in the faulty bar, having been doing their level best to avoid any time loop shenanigans. Because none of them were particularly versed in this extensive level of metaplanar time bullshit, and unless every time travel movie was lying to them, fucking with their past selves would cause problem. Thus, Despite the considerable advances it would have made to science to experimentally change the past, most of the team had just waited at the bar. Then went home after they were sure that they had been arrested. Wildcard, recognizing that it would make everything easier for himself, was sure to get a few touch-ups done on his face during the regenerative therapy he needed to get himself back to normal. And then went home during his own arrest and retrieved his car keys from his own house. Dervish found that his memories returned when he was outside of the subjective space of the shadow metal plane, and mostly just watched pirated trid and hung out with sensei. Who noted that your meeting with knight errant didn't take that long, but otherwise didn't ask questions. Bend found himself a nice tree, turned into a squirrel, and hid away in that identity for a while. And Locke went to Wildcard's house and drank all his coffee again, by excuse of I don't know if knight errant put out my information, so my hideout is compromised. All things considered, things were exactly where the runners wanted them status quo. Needless to say, this would change with their last, and greatest, run. Shadow Run Story Time 18N So I've recently moved Nick Bairdia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. So I am an affiliate of NordVPN. If you have been thinking of getting a VPN with everything going on at the minute NordVPN is offering 75% off a 3 year plan. I have been using Nor myself for a few years now because it helps support a lot of the people I like to watch on YouTube and I think it's pretty cool they have let me become an affiliate. 
so check out nordvpn.org forward slash nickbeardia and use coupon code nickbeardia for 75% off while the offer is on. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop!